Ohio says no thanks to $400 million. From the Battelle studio at WLSU at COSI, this is Columbus on the Record. Joining Mike Thompson this week, Joe Engel, State House reporter for Ohio Public Radio, Julie Carr Smythe, State House correspondent for the Associated Press, Gene Krebs, Senior Director with Greater Ohio, and Joseph Moss, Chairman of the Ohio Hispanic Coalition. Governor elect John Kasich could not have made it more clear during the campaign. If he was elected, restoring passenger rail service across Ohio was dead. Now Kasich is asking outgoing Governor Ted Strickland to stop spending money to study the project, and he asked the Obama administration to take that $400 million in train money Ohio is getting and put it towards fixing highways or cutting the federal deficit. The Obama administration says no. Julie Carr Smythe, no surprise here, but is it, is, it, is it still kind of shocking that the state's gonna just give back $400 million? It is, uh, especially in the time that we're in with the, with the budget uh, facing this incredible deficit. Um, to, to see uh, Kasich sort of struggling to reassert his priorities um, showed that he definitely doesn't want to give the money back. He wants to have it for other uses, but um, it's, it's very unusual what's been happening the last couple, oh, the week and a half since the election in terms of his uh, asserting himself this way. Well, the argument is you take the $400 million, but you're still gonna have to su supplement the trains at $17 million a year, so that would hurt the budget according to the projections. Right, and uh, the Strickland administration made, made a point that they thought the progress that had been made shouldn't be wasted because they actually might be able to use that uh, research for, to help mm -hmm. freight rail, and that mm -hmm. freight rail is something that Kasich is for. So, uh, uh, we should also comment, uh, Mike, that um, the, the money was uh, something that is going to be used within the state of Ohio, but it's something that, yes, could have been used perhaps for other infrastructure projects. The problem is that once these things are earmarked, they're earmarked for a particular purpose, and I think it would have been unreasonable to expect that the federal government was going to allow the redirection of that money. No, I mean, the, the, the uh, high-speed rail, which is the goal, was a major strategy of the Obama administration's stimulus package, that's and that's correct. what this money was for, and if Ohio's not gonna do the rail, then mm -hmm. it goes someplace else. Yeah, but the other thing to keep in mind, though, there's a fair amount of national thought on this, that um, states where the director of their transportation or their governor talks about the pending fiscal collapse of their transportation agency, and that this is placed into that larger context, they tend to have less opposition. Also, the opposition for this was primarily driven by the fact on many Republicans, it looks like ERA, A-A-R-A, -A -A, the, you know, the, the revitalization attempt, stimulus package, and that was, you know, made a lot of people antsy. But um, uh, Kasich did campaign on this, yeah, and the absolutely. voters have spoken, mm -hmm. and so. Joe, at New England, uh, no, New York, is lining up. They said, we'll take Ohio's money and we'll take Wisconsin's right. money. They don't want theirs either. That's $800 right. million. Dollars. Right. And that, you know, this is one of those situations that it remains to be seen because a few years from now, that rail could be a whole lot more popular as an idea um, than it is now. If the gas goes up to $5 a gallon, you know, people are going to say, hey, you know, public transportation, that's a pretty good option. Let's beef it up. And at that point, the rail might have been more popular. And especially if we see other states taking that money and using it for public transportation that looks enticing to Ohio in a few years. This might be something that comes back to haunt Governor Kasich. But will the money be there in two years? Right, and, and that's the interesting thing about New York. Uh, as a former transportation reporter in the state of New York, I mean, they've tried passenger rail so many times they can't even count anymore, and as has Florida and, you know, others. I mean, this was an attempt, I think, to build some kind of critical mass in terms of the public opinion that is just... Uh, I think it fell flat because of the economy um, and people saying, hey, you know, uh, why are we having these perks or toys or whatever when we can't uh, even pay the bills? But I'll, I'll push back a little bit gently and say, you know, once again, states where the director of their DOT or, you know, Ed Rendell over in PA would say, my agency is going broke, 
you know, and a $17 million a year subsidy seems quite small compared to a one point, in Ohio, it's a $1.5 billion structural deficit, according to ODOT's own dollars by 2017. If you take what well, I think is a more realistic look at the numbers, it's $3.9 billion deficit within seven fiscal years. And I think, I think the Strickland administration should have been making more of that out there and saying, we are in a severe financial dislocation on transportation on the highway mode. Let's look and see what we can do for some other I fixed think we rail. We did get a lot of uh, uh, stimulus money for other transportation other purposes, though. Right. So. To get, getting back to how this was sold, this was sold as 3C, connecting mm -hmm. Cincinnati, Columbus to Cleveland. It was never sold as connecting Ohio to the nation's rail system. Mm -hmm. Had it been sold that way, might this have been more successful? I don't think so, but you're absolutely right. This is not a standalone thing. Even though the projects can be controlled by the state government, this really has to dovetail with what's going on in the surrounding states, and now it might not. I'll give you one bright silver lining, though. As a result of all this, I think you're going to see Republicans now willing to say, intra-city transit may be a better thing, and you may actually see them have a more favorable attitude towards some transit going on within the cities, partly out of guilt. Why didn't, <laughs> why didn't John Kasich say, let's put that money towards light rail in these three cities? I think that's because we have not yet hit a consensus. Look here at Columbus, mm -hmm. you know, Coleman's been rather cool, you know, on this of late, so. And the money was awarded for, for the states for their plans. Mm -hmm. So that would, would, have, yeah. would have required a big change in the plan, and who yeah. knows, Ohio might have got, not gotten the money. Okay, let's get to our second topic, the fight over passenger rail. Likely will be nothing compared to the upcoming fights over the state budget cuts. Ohio faces an up to $8 billion deficit. The incoming Speaker of the Ohio House predicts the worst cuts in decades. The incoming Senate president told the dispatch that John Kasich's cuts will take lawmakers' breath away. Joe Ingalls, are Republicans united in, willing, in their willingness to stick with John Kasich as he makes these big cuts? as he promises? Um, right now, they're backing him. They haven't started making cuts yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, I think there's a definite uh, look toward 2012. And what will voters accept? If, if they go out and make a lot of draconian cuts to a lot of popular programs, and if they end up shifting the tax burden from the, your, your state taxes to the local taxes, people are going to pick up on that. If all of a sudden the state cuts all of the schools and um, you have to pay a higher property tax, if the state cuts the universities and they raise tuition a lot so that your kid who's in a state school has to pay a lot more for tuition, people are going to notice that. I think the key here is we've been talking throughout this entire campaign, everyone's been talking taxes. And we need to start talking revenue enhancements. We need to start talking fees mm -hmm. because in the end, a tax is a, it's a semantic thing here, but we've got to look at it in the fact that you may pay more if your taxes go down. Yeah, and I'm gonna gonna go out and say I think that we will see the House, uh, particularly, which it gets the first dibs at the budget. I think we'll see them be less in lockstep with Kasich than we saw the Democratic House be with Strickland. Uh, I think Bill Badshelder is very smart, has a lot of uh, expertise on his staff, and has a lot of history. And I think that he is gonna respect the legislative. Uh, role in a way that that was somewhat what missing this time around. I think, you know, they will have their own plan. That's just my prediction for what they want to do with the budget. That that may very well have some big differences from Kasich. Will that will they include? Because it's either cut or, or taxes. Yeah. Will it? Could the House say, okay, let's delay the tax income tax cut again or? you know, raise the sales tax. Do you see him going that far? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, it's possible. Uh, it was the House Republicans, after all, who ra raised the taxes the last time. It was not the Democrats. Uh, and so, it, you know, sometimes when the need is there, it, the Republicans have shown the, a willingness to support that kind of thing. But I, I think things have changed in the broader picture nationwide, and I think it's going to be very difficult for them to do anything that sounds, smells, or tastes like a tax. And Joe, I'm concerned about your scenario because I agree with you. That is exactly how things are supposed to work. 
if the General Assembly, the people that have been elected to, to represent us, cut uh, projects that, that are, uh, programs that are, that are popular, it's mm -hmm. the people are supposed to react. But what we have seen mm -hmm. in Ohio and other places is that, that when the elections roll around, there is a mm -hmm. distraction of some sort, a Defense of Marriage Act, there is an immigration, a state immigration uh, a bill mm -hmm. introduced that, that can take the, 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 the people's eye away from the ball. And that's what I'm concerned about. I do want to go back to what Joe brought up, is that, well, one, we can fire all state employees and only get $2 billion a year. So we're about halfway there. And I think your point's very good that Ohio uh, ranks 34th in state obligation taxes, but ninth highest in the local obligation. And if we do it wrongly enough, we'll move from ninth up to third, which is not a good thing. And in Ohio, we have 41 government entities per county compared to the national average of 27. So we're completely out of whack on, so I think governance reform is going to be one, and one of the things, go back to Speaker Elect Batchelder said, every 50 years we all look and see how we're doing things, whether it's time or not. <laughs> and I think you may see that type of structural, and because I, I also agree with Joe, the Republic, the, of the 132 legislative districts, 106 of them have an index of 53 or above and 47 or below. Those seats are essentially decided either in the primary or by the majority party for that area Central and Executive Committee party endorsement process. They're either solidly Democrat or solidly Republican. Right. You've got roughly two dozen seats that could be in play depending upon local stuff every year. Boom. And well, I, I think you're right with the distraction, Joe. I think that's absolutely right. We've seen it time after time. But I think also voters look at how they feel. And that's what we saw in this election. Absolutely. We saw voters who said, you know, I'm just not feeling well. And you mm -hmm. had uh, incoming Governor Kasich saying, hey, our state's mm -hmm. not doing well. We've got a really bad tax system. Things are not great. And you had Governor Strickland say, our, our education's fifth in the nation. We've mm -hmm. got this great development department. Since the voters didn't feel good, mm -hmm. they kind of went with, with incoming Governor Kasich. So the question is, in 2012, how much will how voters feel affect how they vote? Right. And I was Go just going to say that I, you know, I think that it's more likely that, that the House is going to come up with some creative solutions um, because, um, you know, it, in the uh, bipartisan atmosphere, it made sense for them to pass the buck. You know, leave the Senate holding the bag mm -hmm. kind of thing, yep. mm -hmm. uh, and then let's fight it out later. But that doesn't make sense in a, you know, when one party's rule. So mm -hmm. it makes more sense for them to work together, do some creative stuff, make it look like it's, it's a plan. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. if they don't fix it, they can't pass the buck. It's right. all on the Republicans right. in right. 2012, exactly. and we'll see what happens right. there. Our next topic, the new governor has begun to shape his new administration and what the new Republican-controlled government will look like. But there are a few loose ends to tie up. Governor Strickland, over the past six months, has appointed a lot of members to boards and commissions, but the GOP-controlled Senate has yet to confirm those, and now it looks like the Senate won't. The dispatch reports that those people may have to step down to, and make way for John Kasich appointees. Gene Krebs, has it been fair for lawmakers to sit on these appointments for the past four or five months? I can see sitting on them yeah. now after the election, but yeah. through the fall and into the summer? Well, uh, I think we need to bifurcate it. If you look at the, you know, there's a lot of controversy about the Casino Commission. And there's been concerns raised about some ethical conflicts of some of the members of the Casino Commission, which gets to a larger problem. How do you want to have a commission based up of citizens who know something about an issue mm -hmm. and then not be employed by somebody who has, you know, some, some game in that? Oh, sorry, bad pun. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, as you look at that, so that's a real issue. So, setting that one aside, the other thing, this whole issue of boards and commissions has been an albatross around this governor's neck for the past two years now. And there are a whole lot of, unfortunately, if, if I were advising Governor Strickland right now, I'd say, be quiet on it. You've got a whole lot of people out there that have been out there now for a couple years that you've never bothered to send over to the Senate. Mm -hmm. 
So just just so this let this one all, go. This isn't all just the Senate's fault. There's right. been other yeah. things as well. Well, and uh, it is something that people don't understand that a lot of these folks sit there uh, for years without being confirmed. And we saw this even with the most controversial of the of the uh, fights, which mm -hmm. was over Kathy Collins Taylor, the, the public, public safety director. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the day the Senate rejected her very dramatically and with a lot mm -hmm. of fireworks, mm -hmm. the legal question was, well, if Kathy doesn't submit her resignation, what mm -hmm. happens next? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, so the process is, I think the process is built to put that block in there for the mm -hmm. Senate, but I also think that it makes sense to, I mean, it is one of the perks of, of a lame duck governor's uh, last few weeks is to be able to say, wow, my party lost, and, mm -hmm. you know, let me save a few people from getting bumped off of the state pension. And Bob Taft did that four years ago, and appointing some of his key people to boards and commissions around mm -hmm. the state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I like my friend Jim Hughes' comment that what they ought to do is just resign and then allow the new governor to appoint them. Of course, he's not going to appoint them if these are all mm -hmm. Democrats mm -hmm. to begin with, but I, I thought it was... Uh, I, I, maybe it was a tongue-in-cheek comment. And we're reporting that, you yeah. know, Rocky Saxby has no plans to resign right. from, so yeah. he's going to make no. the Senate no. vote on I it. I don't think they're going to resign. Please keep one other thing in mind. Most of these boards and commissions have a legal structure that says no more than X from any one political party and yada, yada, blah, blah, blah. So there still so will have to be some balance back there. With all the, budget, that have it, yeah. with all the yeah. budget cutting, is this going to be moot? Are all these commissions going to be in existence a year from now? I was wondering that myself. Some, <laughs> some may not be. <laughs> some Good absolutely question. right. Because yeah. they're not, I mean, these people, some of these, a lot of these commissions, they get paid, and there's staff right. involved and everything staff. else. Yeah. 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 I noticed a lo uh, several yeah. of them actually scheduled some meetings uh, for the <laughs> next week or two, like <laughs> yeah. the Commission on African American Males, and, yeah. you know, I think that they're all sort of like, hey, we've got a lot to do, better get going. Yeah. yeah. Okay, full disclosure, I'm on the board of the Ohio Consumers Council. I was, board, I was appointed by Jim Petro, and then Rich Cordray reappointed me. At most, I can make $900 a year. Okay, so <laughs> you're not going to balance the budget by abolishing that governing but board. But the Casino Commission, I think it's 60000 60, oh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a nice one. All right, our next one, Ted Strickland still has one key appointment he can make when Maureen O'Connor moves up to Chief Justice. Her current Supreme Court seat will become vacant. And before he leaves office, Governor Strickland will have about a week in early January to appoint a new justice, presumably a Democrat. Republicans want Ted Strickland to wait and allow John Kasich to appoint the new justice. Joe Moss, that's going to happen. In the that spirit of bipartisanship, <laughs> I'm Ted that Strickland's going to wait? That is not going to happen. Oh. And, and quite frankly, I don't think it's fair for it to happen. Everybody else in the Supreme Court is a Republican anyway. And he has, by the way, between the 1st and the 9th of January to, to do the appointment. And there are some excellent candidates, by the way. I mean, people that, that everybody, Kent Marcus, his counsel, mm -hmm. uh, wonderful guy. Chief Justice Brown, of course, uh, mm -hmm. who did not uh, prevail in the election. Yvette. McGee Brown mm -hmm. uh, would, have, would be the first African-American member in the, on the Ohio Supreme Court. But there are others, too, Mary Jane Trapp and uh, Jennifer Bruner as, a, uh, as, as possible candidates. Richard Cordray has been mentioned. Mm -hmm. Do you Richard see that? Um, yep. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a possibility. has an extraordinary resume. It could but do very well in private uh, practice as well. But he told uh, Ann Fisher this week on WSU Radio that he has, he's not done with the political game yet, and he's going to run again. Mm -hmm. Is being a Supreme Court justice the best place to be if you want to run for governor in four years? I don't think so. No. 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 I, don't no. think so. I would think that, yeah, Rich, Rich might want to sit uh, on the sidelines somewhere else or get involved. And what's interesting about him is just this other day, I mean, he was on ABC Nightly yep. News. He's, mm -hmm. he's just got a huge uh, mm -hmm. profile right now nationally with the, mm -hmm. with the legal work he's doing. The, so. work, the work against on the f foreclosure. The robo-signing foreclosure mess right. that's going on right now. Right, and so, you know, he's sort of riding high in an odd way, even though he was mm -hmm. defeated. So maybe he can uh, yeah. roll with that for well, a year or two. Uh, there are a couple of candidates that I think um, might be picked up at the Obama administration, or perhaps they should be. By the way, there's a wrinkle I wanted to, I forgot to mention, and that is that I think it's likely that two years from now, when that Supreme Court justice would have to run, that appointee, mm -hmm. uh, we may have rules allowing or perhaps even demanding that your party affiliation be on the ballot. You know, there is a, a pending lawsuit in federal court to that, and it's at least my opinion that that's exactly what is going to happen. So that kind of changes mm -hmm. the selection as to who might be the better candidate two years from now. Eric Brown ran for a Supreme Court 
chief justice, it was a lot of thought that mm -hmm. Strickland had basically promised him that mm -hmm. that job. That no one's ever reported that or, or commented on the record on that. But would it be a would it be a slight if he was not given Maureen O'Connor's position? No, I think if after the the. Uh, extent of his defeat yeah. uh, and uh, the fact that there were a few mm -hmm. issues that came up in the campaign, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that they may, may think he's not the best choice at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get to our last topic. After a week off, <laughs> political ads have returned to the Columbus television sets. I'm you, Judette, and I'm running for president. <laughs> If elected, I promise our $13 trillion debt will double. Maybe even triple. I'll continue to ignore our spiraling debt. And your kids can deal with it later. What? I'm you to debt and I say, borrow like there's no tomorrow. Now, Hugh Jadette is not running for president. Obviously, that's a spoof with a serious message. The ads want voters to tell lawmakers to cut the federal deficit. Gene Krebs, I take it Hugh would not get your vote because you've long <laughs> advocated <laughs> cutting and shrinking government. Yes. Uh, will yeah. the ads work? Um, yes, I think they're going to have to work. Uh, look, you know, we're, we're a smart growth shop, and smart growth is about smart spending, sustainable fiscal uh, accountability, transparency, and what we have at the federal level. Let's put it this way. Right now, the amount we pay on interest on the federal debt, $200 billion, is more than what we spend on education and infrastructure combined. And in just a few short years, um, uh, 2027, 17 years from now, the, our interest payments become the single largest line item on the federal ledger, okay? And by 2055, all the federal government is used to pay off our debt. I mean, this, is, this, this insanity has got to stop. We saw what happened in Greece. We've got to get a handle on it now. And I'm very glad that the Peterson Foundation came into Ohio, and they're using, basically using Columbus as like a test market. Just like this, like everybody here checks out the new hamburgers and everything like that. Mm -hmm. they're, they're checking out this here and they're going to see how it flies. That's right, Columbus and Denver. And, but Gene, I was wondering, isn't this like beating a dead horse? I mean, isn't this a topic that is so much on, the, uh, on everybody's mind and was in the campaign and everything else? It seemed like the timing mm -hmm. was a little, I don't know, overdoing the topic a little bit. Right now, working towards deficit reduction is like a spectator sport. Everybody wants to watch it happen. Nobody wants to actually get out on the field and play the game. And I think what this is an effort is, is try to pull the citizen in and say, you need to play the game too. But that was a nice ad, very funny, tongue in cheek, Absolutely. very well mm -hmm. done. But here's the reality, as the debt commission chair, co-chair is released mm -hmm. this week, it's gonna mm -hmm. take eliminating the mortgage uh, tax, Did mortgage you? interest tax reduction, right. increasing the retirement age to 69. Um, mm -hmm. Other things like that that are not, that's the hard work. Mm -hmm. Cutting the debt is great, but who will that happen? And defense. Yes. 17%. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. interestingly, uh, they actually cited some exit polling as uh, evidence that the American people are ready for, um, to tackle this. And mm -hmm. uh, it turned out it was AP exit polling, so I went back <laughs> and checked the numbers. Uh -huh. Um, and really, the majority of Americans who who said this is, should be our top priority, mm -hmm. that number was pushed mostly by Republicans and Independents. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a, a message that's resonating with the whole Tea Party movement and with the uh, mm -hmm. with the Republican sweep. Um, and we did have one group that came out and said, you know, we think this is just a you know a guise for trying to to cut Social Security benefits. Well, and I think it's a mixed message, to be quite honest, because the same people often who are pushing, let's eliminate the debt, are the same people who say, and let's give huge tax cuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't do that. I mean, right. think about your own budget at home. If you're you know, giving someone a huge break that owes you money, and that money's not coming into your home budget, but yet you owe a bunch of money on your credit card, you know, that's, gonna, that's going to be a, mm -hmm. uh, discon you know, it's going to be incongruent when yep. you go to do your budget. And it's the same thing with the federal government. You've got to have the money coming in to pay down the debt. And are people willing to pay higher taxes to pay down the debt? That's the question we don't know. And we'll see this all play out over the next couple of weeks as we look at the so-called Bush tax cuts, and which are set to expire at the end of the year. We have to get to our final off-the-record parting shots. Joe Moss, we'll start with you. 
my traditional post-election thoughts and maybe commentary. I hope that the divisiveness of the election can take a back seat now that the goal is to govern wisely. Woodrow Wilson said, there is no higher calling than human service. To work for the common good is the greatest creed. Okay, Gene. Uh, I'm going to build upon what Joe said and said and say that one of the ways to fix this political process, uh, desegregate the floors on the Rife Tower where that houses the members of the House of Representatives. Right now you have, you know, 10 and 11, 12 and 13 are all segregated. If you were to by go party, ahead, you mean. by party, if you were to go ahead and have RD, RD, RRD, RD, RRD, all the way around, it's just like college, where you, you know who you, who's in your dorm wing, and who do you, that's who you go have lunch with. Mm -hmm. And you built, look, 40 years ago, they all worked at their desk at the State House. That was their office. Okay. They knew each other. Julie. Which is, uh, I just changed my final thought because of what you just said. I, I'll predict that the John Kasich administration will not be situated in the State House as Strickland has been. Most governors haven't been since the Rife Tower was built, but we uh, saw Strickland move back in there with his staff and um, was often seen in the hallways and that kind of thing, and I'm, I'm predicting that won't happen. In case it goes back to the tower. Sure. I think uh, one of the things we're going to see is, is Ohioans are going to notice um, when you know, there's this, this theory out there that uh, Ohio is fat cat, that the state government has a lot of room uh, that they haven't been cutting. But if you look, they cut a billion and a half dollars from the former budget to this past budget. Mm -hmm. And uh, Governor Kasich is going to have to cut even more. Okay. So I think Ohioans are going to see a lot of cuts that they're not going to like. Great. That's Columbus on the Record for this week. Please check us out online. We're on Facebook and Twitter. You can check it out at wosu.org slash COTR. For our crew, for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.